that back some of the homeworks is a new one up here. Um, the there's also a comment on the homework that you're handing in today that there's a um, typo. The there should be a factor of i in in the um, formulation of the beta time ordered phi of x phi of x prime beta. So if you look back at our definition of the propagator to begin with, there was this factor of i here. It's correct in the on the the homework sheet on the the board up on the the, the website now. So that should be there just otherwise you'll be off by a factor of i everywhere. Um, other comments on back on on the homework that I just handed back. If you there were, was a, a good deal of confusion between first order and second order. Just let me remind you, first order and second order phase transitions are ones where the, the order parameter, first order, the parameter, whatever the thing that, do that governs the phase transition, it's called the order parameter, is discontinuous. Okay, so it jumps from one to the other. Um, second order, the or whatever the thing is, it goes continuously. And in the, the example that we had there, there was in the first case th that you worked on, there was a second minimum that developed, but it, you did, couldn't get there smoothly. There was a bump in between, so there was a discontinuous jump. So the first, that gave you a first order phase transition. The second case that you worked out, the minimum started at zero and moved away. So that was a continuous second order phase transition. Okay, any questions about that stuff? All right. The what we did last time, I, I just, let's see, I have it sitting here, uh, should be there. The, this is where we ended last time. We ended up giving, having worked out some of the rules for doing matrix elements, and there they are, you know, typical things. When you have initial states, you put e to the minus i p to x dot x. Final states, you put plus p dot x, there's one over root twos. The derivatives turn to either minus IP or plus IP, depending on the, the case. Um, for Dirac's, we had U's and U bars in various ways. So I have a couple comments to finish this out, this little section here. I want to do first something using the, the rules that are listed up here the final state and initial state rules um, and illustrate the idea of crossing, which tells you matrix elements, related matrix elements, so you can just read them off. And then the second thing I need to do is I need to do this business with the drag particles. Okay, so that's our first task, is to finish up explaining that set of rules. Okay, so the first thing is this idea of crossing. The idea of crossing has to do with the types of matrix elements that we took. We worked out matrix elements of a, a particle going to a particle with a photon either in the initial or final state. We wrote out some rules that look like the creation of a particle antiparticle. We also wrote out the rules for antiparticle antiparticle, so antiparticle giving out photons. And um, there's of course one that we didn't work out, which is 
particle, antiparticle, turning into a photon. Okay, so those are all the types of things that you can work out the matrix elements for using those rules. It turns out they're all related. And you can sort of see the relation if I just write out the answers. Um, so let's just write out the answer for phi of P2. I'll just do the current part. So the photon part's pretty easy. Uh, phi of P1. Well, that was a bunch of stuff. And then the interesting stuff was the charge, P1 plus P2 mu. And then e to the minus i, P1 minus P2 dot x. Okay. So now let's write out the next, another one. Let's write out the one, I, the one I have is phi, I'm going to keep this P2 there, and I'll make this phi bar of P1. J mu. Zero. Okay. That's one we worked out. It turns into Q um, P2 minus P1 mu e to the minus i. Well, it's, it's plus i. Uh, P1 plus P2 dot X. Okay. And there's, and there's the same sort of stuff in front. There's all that square root of two omegas, et cetera. Okay. So the point I want to notice here is that these two matrix elements are the same, except that the P1 that was in the initial state here is now an antiparticle in the final state, and they differ by a minus sign. So there's a P1 is turned into minus P1. And I've flipped the particle in the initial state to an antiparticle in the final state. So that's, that's the, the name of crossing. I've crossed this. That's how you would say it. I've crossed the particle into the final state. It becomes an antiparticle in the final state. And the matrix element just flips that, that sign there. OK, so now let's let's write the next one down in this series. I'm going to keep phi bar of P1 here, J mu, and I'm going to write phi bar of P2, P2 in the initial state. Okay? If we go through what we did before, that's minus Q P1 plus P2 mu e to the minus i um, p it was p2 minus p1 dot x and that's what the rules told okay so basically going from this line to this line we just we what i pointed out before was we flipped the side of q it was plus q for the particle and minus q for the antiparticle but everything else was essentially the same. Okay, but now instead of the, in the sequence here, the sequence of crossings, what I'm doing here, and I'm going to cross this phi into the initial space, so it becomes the phi bar, P2, and this is again related by taking P2 to minus P2. So there's a minus sign in front of P1 already, so the you take P2 to minus P2, okay? And if we had worked it out, the last one in the sequence would have been 0 J mu phi of P1 phi bar of P2 equals um, Q P1 minus P2 mu e to the minus i p1 plus p2. Okay. So again, the same old stuff in front of it. Okay. 
And that can be gotten either of two ways. One is I can cross this phi from here into the final phi. So phi bar becomes phi. And I flip the sign on P1. So P1 comes now with a positive sign. P2 remains with a negative sign. Or I could have done it from this guy here, flip this into the initial state, changing the sign of P2. Okay, so it hangs, it's consistent. So basically what we've illustrated here is what's called crossing rules. So you move initial state to move one way or other to the final state. Either way works. You take PI, whatever that particle is, and make it minus PI. And that just comes from initial and final state rules. And particle be, be, gets interchanged with antiparticle. Okay. okay, so that's your general rules. And you, the other cases, if you're doing this with photons, the other thing you do, you take epsilon mu and turn it into epsilon star mu. So those get interchanged, just initial and final. And for the Dirac field, you take use and interchange them with Vs. Okay, so we haven't worked that, that business out yet. But basically this, this tells you that if you know one of these matrix elements, you know them all. You can just sort of write them all out. Yes? Yeah, yeah the exponential is uh, later today, it will happen today, is going to turn into momentum conserving delta functions. Okay, it's going to disappear from the Feynman rules, so you won't see it in Feynman rules. It's just sitting here in matrix elements at the moment, but when you calculate some transition amplitude, it turns into a delta function. Okay, because you end up integrating over x is basically the point. It's the you know ha interaction Hamiltonian has an integral d4x in it. That's what we're going to see. So that that then forces momentum conservation of all the particles in that interaction. Okay, there we go. That's where we're going. Good question. Okay, so that, that was one of the things I needed to tell you. The other thing I need to tell you is the Dirac stuff. How, how you do with Dirac. Remember that psi of x had the following expansion. It was the integral d4, d3p, 2 pi cubed. Um, the solutions were e to the minus i p dot x u of p, and it might have a spin label. And we used the creation operator b of p and s. And the other one was e to the plus i p dot x v of p, s, and we used the d dagger. And that was that led to the consistent quantization rules. Okay. And so now let's just let's just look at a, a simple matrix element here. Let's take the current J mu, which was the charge times psi bar gamma mu psi. And let's take a look at a couple of matrix elements. Okay. The If I take a fermion in the, in the initial state, fermion in initial state with momentum P1, fermion in final state with momentum P2, and current in between, there's a matrix zone. Okay. okay, so there's what we want to do. So here's Q, fermion, well, actually, let me, let me write this out so I can play with it. 
and, and I'm going to actually start on the next line because it's probably a big long, big long line. Q. And on, on this side, well, starting over on that side here, I, I write the Fermi on the initial state as B dagger of P and S acting on that, on the empty state. Okay, so that's the initial Fermi on state. The final one I'm also going to write zero. It's the Hermitian conjugates of this B of P. So this is P1 over there. Here's P2. And uh, let me leave off the, the S labels for this. They leave that implicit. OK. Then I've got to take the fermion fields there. So somewhere in the middle is going to be a gamma mu. Sitting on the other side of it over here is the integral d3p 2 pi cubed e to the minus i p dot x u of p s uh, b of p again plus dot 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 the the d daggers don't play a role here all right so there's psi psi bar sits on the other side then and it's integral d3 p prime just a integration label 2 pi cubed i have e to the plus i p dot p prime dot x um u bar of p prime b dagger of p prime okay so there's the important stuff. The Ds aren't playing any role here because they, they can't do anything. But this guy now is going to annihilate that. So this, this turns into 2 pi cubed delta 3 of P minus P1. And these two, this one creates that. So, boink, this is 2 pi cubed delta 3 of p prime minus p2. And the whole thing then collapses down to just a simple matrix element. It's just q u bar p2 gamma mu u of p1 the minus i p1 minus p2 dot x. Any comfortable with that, everybody? Okay, so that's the obvious thing. Um, let's see if I can leave that there. Now, the antiparticle case. Let's do the antiparticle case. Let's do antiparticle of P2 J mu antiparticle of P1. And this is where the, all the surprises come. This, the, the, that is sort of what you might have obviously written down. There are some surprises in this one. So we start off again. Q, zero. Now I use D of P2. And over on the other side, I have 0 D dagger of P1. That creates, that's the initial state. Yes? Is that a D dagger or a D dagger? Uh, it's a D dagger. I said D and I wrote B. What do you know? Thank you. I was looking at how much space I needed up above. Okay. And then we, again, we write out the current here, the psi bar gamma mu psi. So the psi piece is the integral d3p over 2 pi cubed. Now we forget about the first piece, and we have the solution. The second piece is e to the plus i p dot x d dagger of p times v of p. 
Okay, that's the the other solution. And on the second side over here, we have integral d three p prime two pi cubed e to the minus i p prime dot x v bar of p prime and it's d of p prime okay so i've just taken the other piece not not the v not the u piece but the v piece but otherwise it looks in the same okay but now we actually have something a little different hop happening the this guy here doesn't annihilate that like it did up here actually this one over here creates the final state particle so this is a d dagger here's the d that annihilates the initial one so in fact we have we have um this guy going over creating that this guy coming around annihilating that okay <coughs> so p becomes p2 which is uh, so let's just write that part out here okay e to the um, minus i p1 minus p2 dot x the minus i comes from here minus i p1 comes from here the plus i p2 comes from here and this is is exactly the same as above okay so it's exactly anything in the initial state has e to the minus i p dot x final state is e to the plus i p dot x so that part's unchanged the the power the the solutions go in different places the v is this is v of p2 this is v bar of p1 so that i get v bar of p1 gamma mu v of p2 okay now this guy this is backwards now this looks backwards Remember, the initial state was here, the final state was there. Here, the, the initial state is the V bars, and the final state is the Vs. So that's, that's a bit funny. So, so let's point out that, put a little exclamation point there. And there's one more feature that comes out, and that's there's a minus sign and what the, let's in contrast to what we had above this was sitting right next to this guy this one was sitting right next to that guy so it just gave us delta functions down here the the operator much of the stuff is just numbers the operators are the, the b's and the d's i have to pass this d through past that d bar, I mean this d dagger past that d, to get it sitting next to this guy, or equivalently I could take this one and put it over next to this one by passing it through the d0. So there's one crossing, one place where they have to swap places. But remember they anti-commute. So there's a minus sign when I take this ordering and write them in the opposite ordering, I pick up a minus sign. So the answer comes out minus q times that. Everything else works out the same. So the other exclamation point goes right there. This is all good news. Um, that's, this is just the charge is opposite. The antiparticle charge is opposite. And the first one is just how it has to work out. There's always a size on this side, and size have Vs, and sidebars on that side, and 
pi bars have v bars, so that's how it's always going to work out. Um, so that's good. Uh, I it can make this appear also useful is that at low velocities, if you look at what the spinners were, u bar and let's make p2 is equal to p1 vector. u bar gamma mu u equals, it turns into q1 in the time component plays p over m velocity in the spatial component piece times chi dagger chi, which is just the spinners, which is 1. Okay, so if you just work out what that matrix element is, go to the low velocity. It has the usual form that you expect for a current, charge and velocity. Likewise, that's exactly what you get with V bar gamma mu V in, in that same limit. So this does look like they're just two separate particles, two particles with opposite charges moving with a current. Okay. Another thing I won't I won't work out, but I'll just state is if I did let's imagine I did this current to from nothing to fermion P two anti fermion P one. Okay. Well then the exponents we'd expect to be uh, either the plus i p1 plus p2, that's dot x, that's what we always get for that. And the spinners would work out to be u bar of p2 gamma mu v of p1. Okay, it's sort of half of each of these calculations up above. The u bar of p2 is just like the fermion of p2 that we worked up there. The anti-fermion in the final state was just like this V here, that I've now called P1. Okay? So this this set of rules is just what we saw there in the the other case. So incoming particle is U, final state particle is U bar. Incoming antiparticle is V bar, and outgoing antiparticle is V. That's the derivation of those rules. Okay. Let's go, let go back, open that up. Is there any charge in that term? Oh, yes, there is a charge. Thank you. Q. And, you know, to be honest, I actually don't know. I have to think a little bit if there's a minus sign. Okay. There's the chart. Thank you. Um, the, 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 whether there's a minus sign or not is actually ambiguous on how you write this state here. Because if I interchange the two particles, there's a minus sign associated with that. Okay. So I hope that's not too confusing. Okay, so there's, that's QED. So we've done all these interactions in QED. We have all the rules out. You can take all the matrix elements. You can impress your friends by writing out all these matrix elements off the top of your head. Okay, let's do some other interactions. And there are two that I use throughout the course a lot. In principle, you can do anything. You know, you can r dream up any interaction that you want. It's like quantum mechanics. You can dream up any potential in quantum mechanics. You know, quantum mechanics is a framework. V, v of R is chosen to de depending on your problem. So here, depending on what your problem is, you choose what your interaction should be. So it gets limited in renormalizable field theories. We, we'll get there. But there's a limited set then. But you still have some choices. 
So, it, but basically, it's at your discretion. And there's these two choices that I like to use here in much of the teaching. One case I'll call uh, lambda phi to the fourth. Okay, so we'll, we'll just call it phi to the fourth theory. Okay, and what it actually is, the, the, the specifically, I'll take the interaction Lagrangian, at least for scalars, is minus lambda over four phi to the fourth. And so phi, it's one of these things that you saw in your homework problem, and you see another one in next week's homework. It's a potent possible interaction. It's sort of like a a density squared interaction. And later on we will actually show you that this is this can be gotten from a local limit of two particles interacting with each other. But the logic here the, the, the is that phi squared is sort of like psi, uh, psi star psi is for fermions or you know usual stuff and so phi to the fourth is sort of like psi star psi psi star psi so both these things at the, at the same point okay so you know we, we might sometimes even use that interaction okay and this is going to be used in, in scattering processes. So it's, it it's, takes particles from initial states and, and changes their stuff. It's sort of like bumping into each other. You know, if you think of this guy as one particle, this is another. They're evaluated at the same point, so they, they hit each other, they bump into each other. And that's what it that's what it, it mimics. It mimics the interaction of two particles locally at, at where you don't take them at different points, but you take them at the same point. That's its purpose. So you bump into each other and you scatter them. Okay, so that's one of my favorites that I use a lot. And the other one I'm going to use is. I'm going to take a complex scalar which I'll call chi and a real scalar phi so and with the interaction Lagrangian L is minus some coupling constant chi dagger chi phi Okay, so here, if you think about the interactions that you get out of that, you get things that look like a chi coming in, chi coming in, emitting a phi. Or you could, since this is a complex scalar, you could have the antiparticles, chi bar, chi bar, emitting a phi. And so this is a surrogate like QED. Okay. So the phi is like the charge particle, uh, chi is like a charge particle. And phi is like, it's like a charge particle, it's like the photon. But the advantage of using this is that you don't have all the complications of, you know, gamma matrices, fermions, Lorentz vectors, all the, all the complications of QED aren't there, and you can use this just to illustrate the important points of field theory without having to go through a lot of song and dance. And then at the end of the day, I just will give you the, the same rules that come out for QED, which will be, should then be obvious how you get them. Okay? So, this is my stand-in for QED. Okay, so let's take a couple sample calculations here with these guys. Okay, the first one. Let's take 
a matrix element of lambda over 4 pi to the fourth uh, P1, P2, P3, P4. So this is a transition matrix element that you know that takes you from some incoming state labeled by P1, P2, P2 coming in, outgoing is P3 and P4. Okay. And the matrix element's pretty easy. There's there's the, the coupling constant lambda over four. That's just definition. You get all these momentum factors just like before. Either the um, minus i p1 plus p2 minus p3 minus p4 dot x. There's one over the square root of two omegas for each of the guys. One over two omega one, two omega two, two omega three, two omega four. And we're almost done except for what I'll call P. It's a permutation or counting factor. Okay. So without going through all the, the, the steps, okay, you know, remember, just think of how, how we would do this. We write each of these phi's as integral d3 p's of e to the minus i p dot x's with b's and creation operators and annihilation operators. And we let the annihilation operators kill these guys, picking up those factors, the creation operators kill, kill those guys or create those guys picking up these factors, etc. Okay, so all that stuff is the same as before. But the, the counting factor comes from the fact that there's four phi's here, and I don't know which one of them, but any one of them could annihilate P1. Another one of them could annihilate P2. But there's lots of, there's a bunch of choices there. Okay? So, to get p, you're just counting how, how these, how many ways that this can happen. Okay. So if you do this, there's four ways to annihilate p1. So I have four fields here. I'll take one of them any one out of the four is equivalent, and use one of them annihilation operators to do the P1, okay? There's then three leftover ways, there's three fields left over to annihilate P2. Uh, I just take another one out of that bunch. There's then two ways to create P3, and then there's one one lonely field left over. P4. Okay. And it could, if I'd started with any other ordering, you know, creating P4 or something, you'd still have the four, three, two, one pattern. So that counting factor is the term P is four factorial. Okay, so the matrix element of this is then is a bunch of stuff out in front times six lambda, and I'm going to start not writing this stuff because it's sort of, sort of universal. We'll, we'll get rid of it. C to the minus i momentum dot x over the square root of two omega one up to the two omega four. We're going to end up dropping this in the end, but there we go. Okay. So sometimes you get these counting factors. The the second example is 
let's take just take this state, you know, P1, P2, or this is a chi, chi emitting a phi with momentum Q. If we take the matrix element of chi of P2, phi of Q, so phi is in the final state, I take then the Lagrangian is G chi dagger chi phi, or that's what I'm taking here, and I have the chi in the initial state of momentum P1. Okay. okay, so again, you get all these stuff. You get all the factors with the exponent and the square root stuff, which, as I promise, I'm not writing anymore. And you get G. Okay? Basically, there's no counting factor here. This chi has to annihilate the initial state. This chi dagger has to create the final state. This field phi has to create that chi in the final state. So there's no counting factor. Okay. Good. Comfortable there? Okay, so if you're comfortable, I'm going to go on and start perturbation theory now. Okay, so we've learned how to read these Lagrangians. The next step is to use it. So we're going to do perturbation theory. And the plan of this is the following. Is I'm going to start off with a time development operator. So we'll do that. This is how states propagate in time, so how they change in time. We'll then go to that and calculate full transition amplitude. And we do enough of those. And I have to admit, it gets a little painful at some stages along the way. We're going to end up with the Feynman rules. OK? So that's what we do. Okay. And, and the, the, our pathway here reminds me of the story about stone soup. How many people know stone, stone soup? OK, so it's probably an American thing. Um, stone soup is, if you want to make stone soup, here's how you make stone soup. You should take a stone and you wash it off and you put it in the pot and you fill the pot with water and you turn the water heat on and you're starting to make stone soup. And to flavor the, the, the soup a little bit, you know, you chop up some celery and you put it in. You chop up some carrots, you put it in. You little peppers maybe. You just put salt and pepper in. You let it cook for a while. And at the end of the process, you take out your stone soup, your stone, and you enjoy your stone soup. Okay? That's basically... So, you know, you have this lus luscious soup uh, that started with the stone. That's basically what we're going to do here. We're going to start off with this time development operator and go through this long process of cooking this stuff up. We're going to end with the Feynman rules, and then we're going to throw away all the early stuff. You'll never do it ever again unless you ever have to work through some theory that you're a bit unfamiliar with. You never do that. A you know, field theorist doesn't ever pull out the time development operator. It's just a tool to get you to the Feynman rules. You keep the Feynman rules and you enjoy them and you, you forget about all the, the, the stone that went into cal cooking it. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to cook some stone soup. Okay, so to get us started, I have to recall some things for you. And the, the main thing to recall is what's the, called the interaction picture. Okay. So here, in the interaction picture, we divide the Hamiltonian into the, the, uh, some simple Hamiltonian and the interaction piece. So the first piece is just in quantum mechanics, you only p squared over 2m. Maybe with some potential you could solve, but something solvable in the interaction pieces, the interaction, new stuff. Okay? And 
we take our basis states um, due to H0, zero okay? And so for us, this is, this is the particle states. PI. Yeah, so, you know, the momentum states that we have. So, H0 for us will be something like the Klein Gordon field, Lagrangian, or the photon field, Lagrangian, but without interactions. So, the interactions are going to be treated separately. Okay? So, the if you do this in the interaction picture, this is time independent. If H, the interactions are zero. So it just basically stays the same state if there's no interactions. And, but the converse also happens is that the states change. due to interactions. And the fact the way they change is the following is psi of T is the time development operator T of, in T0 from psi of T0. So if you have some state psi of T0, you want to know at a later time there's some time development operator. So here's our time development operator. Okay. So, I am going to proceed by assuming you've seen this. If you haven't, well, even if you have, you probably maybe you should go back and review it. I'm going to give you the, the conceptual development of how you, you develop the time development operator. Here's what the answer is. The time development operator T, T, zero is the time ordered exponential of the in integral minus I integral DT, um, T zero up to T, so DT prime, of the interaction Hamiltonian of T prime. Okay, that's that's going to be our starting thing, and, and that that's the piece. I'm not going to. It takes a whole day in quantum mechanics to to go through all this stuff in detail. Here's the here's the the quickie version. Now here's how you do it. Basically, you define the states in this interaction picture such that they satisfy I d by d t psi interaction of T is H interaction of T psi interaction of T. Okay? So that's the statement that the states are time independent if the interactions um, Hamiltonian is zero. Okay? So they, they would just stay the same. Okay? We then turn it into an integral equation by integrating that. So you integrate one side with respect to time you get psi i of t minus psi i of t zero is minus i integral dt prime h i T prime phi integral of T prime. So I just integrated both sides with respect to T prime. This this side of course here integrates to just the endpoints. This side integrates to um, this 
which we don't know how to do because this is the field that we're trying to solve. You know, this you have to know it at all times to solve this equation. Okay, but then if you're doing perturbation theory, you might imagine iterating this. So you take psi i here, psi i of t is psi i of t zero minus this thing. Okay, so in here I write this as psi i of t zero minus another integral. Okay, so you you get the following. It turns into then psi i of t is psi i of T zero minus i integral d t prime h i okay well the first thing I would if I write psi i of t prime here I have the, the same equation again so instead I I approximate it by I of t zero plus another integral. Um, so this is then psi i of t zero minus i integral from t zero up to t prime h dt double prime h i of double prime okay and then it's actually without any approximation I write this as psi i of t double prime I've, I've actually not made an approximation yet okay so I've just written this using the, the, the upper formula okay. the approximation then is to write this as psi i of t zero plus another integral, which which is the, the third term in it, and so we end up then with the writing this as one minus i integral d t prime h i t prime minus i squared it's, it's plus, it's a plus a minus i squared so let's get that right integral so the first one goes to zero up to t zero up to t the next one goes t, t double prime t zero up to t prime dt prime t zero up to t h of t prime h t double prime okay and then there are there are more and more terms and it's psi i of t zero okay so at this stage, so basically, it's this series expansion of integrals where you start with t0, you propagate with the Hamiltonian for a while, you then have another Hamiltonian, etc. Okay, so this is the factor in square brackets is the time development operator. It takes the initial state, ends up with the final state. It's not quite the form that we have it up above there. Um, okay. the, the last form is there's a ch change of variables. And th this is the part that actually takes the longest to, to show. But what you see here is the thing that sits on this thing is the earliest interaction. So it goes from t0 up to t prime. So t prime is always later than t0, than t double prime. 
And if you play with that for a while, you can write that second piece as the integral dt prime from t0 up to t, integral dt double prime t0 up to t prime, h of t prime h of t double prime as one half the integral d t prime d t double prime both of them from t zero up to t of the time ordered product of the Hamiltonian of t prime. Okay. Okay. So the time ordered thing always just tells you that whatever is the earlier time sits off to the right. The factor of two is that, the, that since I've changed the integration variables to always be from t zero up to t um, instead of having this this ordered integration. And what you do to, to make the proof is you, you go through, draw out the integration region for, for this one, draw out the integration region for that one, do some relabeling of variables, and find that the extra piece that you get here is just equal to the initial piece. And so that gives you this, there's a factor of two. OK, and so it's, it's, that's, that's strictly an identity. It's true no matter what the Hamiltonians are. Yeah, so it's a double integral. Both of them are, okay, let's be specific, t0 up to t in both cases. Okay, so it's a double integral where you go over the whole range from t0 to t. And the only trick is that you order these things with the earliest over here, whichever one is earlier. Okay. And then you've got the compact notation then so we make is this factor here that we had up above there, which is ui of t and t0, is then written as the time-ordered exponential e to the minus i t0 to t, dt prime h i prime, where it just means that you expand, you, you put these in time orders, and then do, you do all integrations from t0 up to t. Okay, so this, this term here with the 1 half is just the, the term minus i over 2, minus i squared divided by 2, it comes from that exponential. I've got the time ordered, I then do the integral. Okay, so that's what it means. Okay. So that's that's supposedly review. If it if it is, I hope it's enough review. But otherwise, if it's not, you need to go back and take a look at this. You know, review the Schrodinger Heisenberg in interaction pictures and that beast from quantum mechanics. Okay, but now let's do an example. This is now our first example of a full calculation. And it's really one we've done already, except that it, all the factors are here now. I'm going to take the theory to be this lambda, the interaction Lagrangian is minus lambda over 4, phi to the fourth, so it's lambda phi to the fourth theory. I'm going to take my states as time goes is to minus infinity, the states are going to be p1 and p2. So they, they're initially way back in the distance past p1 and p2. I then time develop them to the far future, to t goes to plus infinity. So in other words, I take this interaction Hamiltonian of infinity minus infinity, taking it from minus infinity to plus infinity of P1 and P2. 
And then I'm going to ask the question, what happens? And look in particular at uh, the amplitude for finding this state in the final state, psi f, is p3, p4. That's the final state that I'm after. So the initial state is my initial. Is, that's initial, not, not interaction. Sorry. Initial. The initial state's that. The final state's p3, p4. What's this amplitude? Okay. It, here I'm just going to get the amplitude out. In our next section, we turn that into a cross section. But today I just want the full transition amplitude. Okay. So the transition amplitude from my initial state to my final state is just then P3, P4, time development operator of infinity minus infinity, P1, P2. Okay. Okay. This guy is it's often called the S matrix. Um, that's not that relevant for us right now, but it's it's equal to the time ordered product of the exponential of the integral from minus infinity to plus infinity dt of the interaction Hamiltonian function of t. But the interaction Hamiltonian we then write as the integral over all space of a density. Okay, so it's minus i integral dt over all space over all time integral d3x of a Hamiltonian interaction Hamiltonian density. Okay, so the scripting means density. And the Hamiltonian interaction Hamiltonian is minus the interaction Lagrangian. Okay. So this is time ordered product of the exponential of plus i integral d4x interaction Lagrangian. Okay. Okay. So in all of our examples, um, the Hamiltonian interaction Hamiltonian is just minus the interaction Lagrangian. Okay. Yeah. It's, remember, it's pi phi dot minus l, and so as long as you don't change what pi means, you know the the canonical momentum, then it's just the minus L part that contributes. Okay? And that's that'll be all of our examples. Okay, so here, let's just quickly see if we can do it. So the first order in lambda, we're doing perturbation theory, so I'm going to work the first order in lambda. TFI is P3, P4, 1 minus I lambda over 4, integral D4x phi to the fourth of x and t, plus dot, 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 P1, P2. Okay. Well, we've the only thing new that's or, or appeared around now is this integral d4x. All this other stuff is stuff we did before. So, just pulling that out of our hat, we get minus i integral d4x lambda over four times four factorial. That was what we got before, and then you get e to the minus i p1 
plus P2 minus P3 minus P4 dot X. And you get these stupid normalization factors, 2 omega 1, 2 omega 2, 2 omega 3, 2 omega 4. Okay. And here's, as promised, comes our, our delta function. Uh, uh, this, this matrix element only happens if you uh, conserve energy and momentum. P1 plus P2 plus P3 minus P4. So the only transitions you're allowed to consider are ones that conserve energy. That's, that's actually new. It wasn't there before. You know, the, there's um, these stupid normalization factors, 2 omega 1 up to 2 omega 2. And what's left over is going to, I'm going to always write as M. And so what we've found here is the matrix element is 6 lambda, or the way I will actually write it is minus I M is minus 6 I lambda. Okay. When we do the Feynman rules, the Feynman rules will be a set of rules for minus I M, and the rule will be minus 6 I lambda, okay, for this case. Okay. So that, in fact, is a Feynman rule. We just have to formalize it. Yes? Oh, the time, well, so they're all at the same time, right, in the interaction. So it's a good point. And my next example has the time ordering in it, where it because we work to next order. But this is all at, at one time here, so I don't time ordering didn't play any role. Okay, it will in the next example. And in fact, I, I'm not going to have any chance to do the next example. So, what we're going to, where we're going to get to eventually, is the stuff that I always call the stupid stuff, the the normalization factors and the delta function will be discarded. It, it goes into features like how you calculate the rules for calculating cross sections and matrix elements. Cross sections and decay amplitudes will all end up conserving energy momentum, so that piece will be there. They'll all have these factors of two omega floating around in those rules, but I'm not going to need them for anything else. So that's this will be universal. For any external state, you'll get the normalization factor, and you'll always get the overall momentum conservation out of all any of these amplitudes, these transition amplitudes. So T is always going to have this minus I delta function times M. And our goal is then to build up how you get lots of different M's in first order perturbation theory, second order. Later on, we're, we're going to have to go to second order to lambda squared, where it's these aren't going to be at the same point. We're going to do complicated ones. So, as I said, it's a little painful, but then we end up with the Feynman rules. Okay. So I think I will stop there. We'll come back next time and do one that's equivalent to electron-proton scattering, where we actually see a propagator come out. We'll, we'll now s explain why you used the propagator in the first place. Okay. Good. That's next time. Yes, very good. The, the new one is over there, and your old one is right here. <laughs>